Hello to all of you together. My name is Max and I'm the technical moderator for this session um, towards the 2021 uh, Democracy City Summit in Bern. And um, I'm just shortly um, talking about the rules of, of conduct for today's session. And um, yes, first of all, um, be nice to each other. Um, use the chat function if you ha have any questions. Or alternatively, you can also um, click on the bottom of your screen uh, on the participant list. And down there, there should be a raise hand function, which you can use in, uh, if you have any questions. Um, yes, I'm really happy to be here with together with you. And I hope we will have a really nice session here today. Now I'm giving the word to um, Bruno Kaufmann who is the moderator for, for today. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Here is Bruno Kaufmann in Bern, in Switzerland. I'm currently in a prison, uh, in a former prison, uh, which is now the democracy center of the city of Bern, the Politforum Käfigturm. We will, at the end of this session, learn a little bit more about this prison turned democracy center, but it's a very symbolic place for our uh, session today, because today will be about democracy in the city or the city as the hub for democracy and democratization. At the Global Forum, we had uh, for many years cities who were hosting these forums because the forums have a lot to do about participation, about citizenship, about uh, direct democracy, which is very much the city, the place of it historically in history, but also more and more today again. So two years ago, we uh, launched the Magna Carta for an International League of Democracy Cities to increase this conversation between cities, between the experience of cities when it comes to promoting, to developing democracy. And today at this uh, session, we will hear from a couple of cities who are very active on this uh, how they are working, why they feel that democracy is a very important feature for their activity, and also from organizations who are supporting this, who want to bring together uh, cities to work on this. So today we will have four panelists. Uh, first, uh, Claude Lanchon, who is a political scientist and historian from Bern, who will tell us about the city of Bern and democracy, and also how uh, the city of Bern is a very good place to be the host of the next global forum on modern direct democracy next spring. Then we will move to the north, to Finland, to Helsinki, uh, where Anu Markola will join us, who is a participation specialist in the city of Helsinki, which has also approached this issue in a very interesting way. And then we will have two uh, contributions from uh, people who are working with the support of democracy cities. First, from Jose uh, Maria Marin, who is working with the open government uh, 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 program, the local program to support cities on becoming more open, but also more democratic. And finally, Helfri Karl from the Innovation in Politics Insti Institute in Vienna, who has just launched the initiative for a European capital of democracy. So welcome everybody to you and welcome everybody who is joining this session of the online global forum. I'm not totally sure if uh, my colleague uh, Joe Matthews is, is also on the program. It's very early in Los Angeles, but uh, uh, basically we had agreed that he would also say a few words about the Magna Carta, which is basically the program for this conversation because we are describing 20 different dimensions of democratization. And Joe I, just joined Bruno, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, he just joined, that's very nice to hear. So basically the program of the session will be that after uh, Joe's brief introduction of the Magna Carta, we will get an introduction from Claude on Bern. This is a, in even a, a pre-taped one because we also wanted to translate it. German and English, and then we have a conversation with Claude about that. Then we will go to Helsinki, then to Jose, and then to Helfried, and we will get all the chance to discuss this. So if it's possible now, I would like to give the word and the floor to Joe to uh, say a few thoughts about why did we introduce, why did we develop this Magna Carta? 
Welcome, Joe. Joe, can you hear us? Can you can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Excellent. Um, having a little bit of trouble with the, the audio line, so I'm going to speak slowly. Forgive me. Um, uh, two um, falls ago, and uh, on a Friday night uh, at about midnight in uh, 2018, I was sitting in a, a small budget hotel room in Rome uh, when the phone rang and um, it was my um, middle son's second grade teacher uh, from California calling, um, asking, um, uh, uh, demanding to know why my son had not filed his homework for the week. And um, I um, uh, was quite flustered at the time and replied that, um, you know, it was the middle of the night, I was in Rome and I was writing a new Magna Carta. Um, and she uh, reported to the school authorities here that I had called and when I called, I had been drunk. Um, I had not been drinking. I had actually been telling the truth. Um, so that was, um, that was during our, our global forum um, uh, above the forum um, uh, in the city hall of Rome. Uh, and it was actually, that was actually the, uh, in some ways, the beginning uh, of a process of writing a, a Magna Carta, a process that um, continues very much to this day. Um, the story does begin, though, before that. It begins with many years of work um, in this global forum and by Bruno um, with cities all over the world um, and local officials to think about how um, about all the things that um, cities in different contexts in different places have in common as they work to advance democracy. We see, we talk often about and compare the diversity of ideas, but what lies in common. Um, in 2017, um, as the Global Forum was being prepared and agreed to for Rome, uh, the Rome City Parliament um, actually asked uh, you know, called for this for a document, which the Magna Carta was was their idea. They um, um, Roman politicians are like Hollywood producers. Apparently, they want to raise expectations, um, and they produced. Uh, they asked for us to produce as part of the forum a Magna Carta that would try to explain what a democracy city was. Um, I was writing, finishing up the the first draft. Uh, late that night when the teacher called. Um, and what happened the next morning was that um, uh, well more than 150 people meeting in the Rome City Hall um, then began to rewrite and devise that draft uh, and revise that draft. It began as really a list um, of different things. A democracy, city is the, a democracy city is this, a democracy city does this, a democracy city doesn't democracy city does not do this other thing. Um, um, and that was really, uh, it was then published um, at the end of the Our Week in Rome. Um, and since then, it has, it has gone out on the internet and gone around the world and been edited and refined into, um, you know, what is now sort of a list of 20 um, uh, things, uh, sort of concepts for democracy city. I think this document will always continue to be refined. Um, democracy is really a conversation that never ends, uh, a phrase that appeared in that original uh, draft that we, that we talked about in Rome. Um, but the ideas, and, and, and so that's essentially the process. One last note, so you can get to, to, to speak quickly. Um, but why, why do this? Um, certainly there was interest in trying to better connect um, democracy centers in, in through an international league. Um, and that was a league that was announced by uh, Mayor Dr. Ko of Taipei in 2019 um, at the end of our last uh, uh, forum week, last in-person forum week before this one, uh, last fall in 2019. So, so there's an idea that the cities um, can learn from each other. There's also ambition 
for this International League of Democracy Cities to um, even share uh, work or exchange people and staff, um, particularly people who are who work in democracy support and participation. Um, so that's the ideal. I have a higher ambition um, for it that I would suggest, which is that it's at a time when um, so many higher levels of government at the international level or at the nation state level are um, doing things that are not helpful to democracy. Um, there, is a, there is a notion of mutual aid. Um, you know, it's the, the phrase we like to use in battling fires here in California. Cities have to come together and share fire departments. Um, it's something similar for democracy. Um, when fire threatens democracy, uh, authoritarian fires, the need to come together um, and defend ourselves. That, that the cities are, you know, where democracy began and bringing cities together now is, is both how democracy defends itself and continues to develop and expand. Um, so with that frame, you're gonna hear a lot more particulars. Um, I turn it back to Bruno. Thank you very much, Joe. Democracy departments united across the globe. That's a, a great vision. But of course, democracy is then very much lived and worked on the local level. And let's start directly now with the input from Bern. Uh, you will also be able to uh, have specific questions on that. So if you have, if you listen now to Claude's uh, presentation and have specific questions, put it on the chat so we get a very efficient way of, 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 of following up questions after that, because of course the time is short. So let's move here to Bern. Let's move to Claude Longchamp and the city of Bern. And Max, uh, you're welcome to start this uh, take. Excuse me, give me a sec. Yes. Workshop Politische Partizipation in den Städten. Am Beispiel der Stadt Bern und der Schweiz. Teil 1. Partizipation statt Wettbewerb. Partizipation ist das Zauberwort der Schweizer Demokratie. In der Schweiz setzen wir in hohem Maße auf die Beteiligung der Bürgerinnen und Bürger, um das Handeln der Behörden zu legitimieren. Die global vorherrschende Demokratietheorie sieht das ganz anders. Sie folgt meist dem angelsächsischen Ideal mit dem Wettbewerb zwischen mindestens zwei politischen Parteien. Der Machtwechsel soll dauerhaft in Machtkonzentration vermieden und Meinungsvielfalt gewährleistet werden. Vorbilder sind die Demokratien in den USA und Großbritannien. Heute zweifelt man allerdings an diesen frühen Vorbildern. Die US-Demokratie gilt als Oligarchie, in der konkurrierende Clans weitgehend ohne Menschen regieren können. Großbritannien wiederum ist kaum mehr in der Lage, den beschlossenen Austritt aus der EU geordnet zu vollziehen und stürzt von einer Notfallübung in die nächste. Die Schweiz folgte bei ihrer Gründung 1848 dem amerikanischen Vorbild, womit sie ursprünglich eine repräsentative Demokratie war. Dominant war damals eine liberal-radikale Bewegung. Parteien gab es noch nicht. Bis zum ersten Machtwechsel dauerte es ganze 60 Jahre. Dafür haben wir eine andere Form der Demokratie erfunden. Bei uns wählen die Menschen nicht nur das Parlament, sie können auch in Sachfragen mitentscheiden. Das Referendum wurde zuerst in den Kantonen unserer Gliedstaaten eingeführt. Bald darauf begann man es auch auf der Bundesebene zu praktizieren. So kann das Stimmvolk seit 1874 eine Nachkontrolle zu Gesetzesbeschlüssen des Parlaments durchführen. Den Bürgerinnen und Bürgern steht es frei, Beschlüssen zuzustimmen oder sie abzulehnen. Seit 1891 können wir zudem die Bundesverfassung teilweise ändern. Wenngleich dies oft versucht wird, gelingt es meist nicht. Mehr noch, als Verfassung und Gesetz haben die Volksrechte die politische Kultur verändert. 
Die Machtkonzentration bei den Regierenden wurde gebrochen. Verhandlungen zwischen parlamentarischem Mehr und Minderheit wurden nötig. Die Schweizer Politik ist damit in die Mitte gerückt, pragmatisch, sachbezogen und nur gelegentlich ideologisch. Anders als die angelsächsischen Demokratien sind wir keine Wettbewerbsdemokratie oder Mehrheitsdemokratie. Wir sind eine Konsens- oder Verhandlungsdemokratie. Unsere Regierung besteht aus den vier größten Parlamentsparteien, die, wenn gleich unterschiedlich positioniert, zusammenarbeiten müssen. Parteiopposition können wir fast gar nicht. Kontrolle durch Volksrechte dafür ausgesprochen stark. Eis. Teil 2. Partizipation als Teil einer kompletten Demokratie. Unsere Demokratie ist von hoher Qualität. Das weltweit führende wissenschaftliche Projekt zur Bestimmung der Demokratiequalität der Universität Göteborg rangiert 2020 die Schweiz auf den vierten Platz. Nur nordische und baltische Staaten wie Dänemark, Estland und Schweden haben demnach eine qualitativ noch bessere Demokratie. Gemessen wird diesen Hand von Wahlen, dem Maß an Freiheiten, den Garantien von Gleichheit, der Deliberation in der Öffentlichkeit und den Beteiligungsangeboten der Menschen an politischen Entscheidungen. Weltweit ganz top sind wir bei der Partizipation. Das hat aus Sicht der Politikwissenschaft auch seinen Grund. Es sind nicht nur die Volksabstimmungen entscheidend, es rührt auch daher, dass die Zivilgesellschaft bei uns stark beteiligt ist und wir sowohl regional als auch lokal entwickelte demokratische Einheiten haben. Wir wissen, ohne Wahlen gibt es keine Demokratie. Doch Wahlen alleine garantieren auch keine gute Demokratie. Denn eine breite Integration in die Willensbildung ist eine zentrale zusätzliche Anforderung. Durch die Dezentralisierung in einem föderalistischen System wird dies besonders gut realisiert. Lange galt die Schweiz in der vergleichenden Politikwissenschaft als Musterfall für eine Konsensdemokratie. Dies beurteilt man angesichts neuer Konflikte allerdings etwas vorsichtiger. Die Schweizer Politikwissenschaft spricht heute von einem Normalfall an Konsensdemokratie. Typische Institutionen in der Schweiz hierfür sind das Proportswahlrecht, das Mehrparteiensystem, der Föderalismus, das Zweikammernsystem auf Bundesebene, für das Parlament, die Volksabstimmungen und die Kollegialregierung. Auch die Konsensdemokratie braucht Erneuerung. Während der Phase des fast perfekten Konsenses in der Schweiz sank so zum Beispiel die konventionelle politische Partizipation. Aber es nahmen und nehmen periodisch die außerinstitutionellen Formen der politischen Aktivierung zu. Sie sind die Quelle der Revitalisierung von Demokratie. Ein Vorgang, den es auch in perfektionierten Demokratien braucht. Neuerdings sieht man auch Schwachstellen beim Schweizer Modell. Unser Land ist eines der globalisiertesten der Welt. Migration in die, in die und aus der Schweiz kennzeichnet unser Land. Das Ranking im Immigration Inclusion Index fällt angesichts dessen wenig vorteilhaft aus. Top platziert sind Schweden und Finnland. Die Schweiz hingegen befindet sich im hintersten Viertel. Weit unter dem Durchschnitt. Das hat damit zu tun, dass ein Viertel der Einwohner und Einwohnerinnen aus dem Ausland stammen, die Einbürgerungshürden in der Schweiz sehr hoch sind und die politischen Rechte für Ausländer und Ausländerinnen nur sehr selektiv gewährleistet werden. In den großen Städten treten solche Probleme verstärkt auf. Da haben wir auch keine reine Konsensdemokratie. Die meisten Städte haben in den letzten 25 Jahren ihre demokratische Kultur stark Richtung einer partizipativen Demokratie entwickelt. Die Demokratisierung ging damit einher, dass die meist bürgerlichen Mehrheiten für Wahlen in die Regierungen zerfielen und durch Bündnisse aus Linken, Grünen und Mitteparteien abgelöst wurden. Entsprechend ist die SVP im Bund die stärkste Partei in den Städten nur selten in der Regierung vertreten. Die Bundesstadt Bern Sitz von Regierung und Parlament der Schweizerischen Eidgenossenschaft ging 1993 sogar voraus. Sie war die erste Schweizer Stadt, die von einer Frauenmehrheit regiert wurde. Noch heute ist die Mehrheit im Stadtparlament weiblich. Das Grüne Bündnis, eine linksökologische Partei, 
ist seit 30 Jahren eine eigentliche Frauenpartei. Eis. Teil 3. Die Liga der Demokratiestädte. Nun entsteht eine weltweite Liga der besten Demokratiestädte. Im Rahmen des Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy ist jüngst die Magna Charta für eine Liga der Demokratiestädte entwickelt worden. Sie beinhaltet 20 Punkte, die in einer sogenannten Demokratiestadt in hohem Maße vorliegen sollen. In wenigen Stichworten sind dies Demokratisierung als ständige Aufgabe, Räume für Dialoge, Demokratie auf Augenhöhe, Infrastruktur für Partizipation, Schutz der lokalen Selbstbestimmung, Mitspracherecht für Junge, soziale Bewegungen als Demokratiemotor, vom Lokalen zum Nationalen und Transnationalen, Agenda 2030 in der Praxis, Beteiligung als Prozess, Vollzug und viel Transparenz, Stimmbeteiligung leicht gemacht, jede Einwohnerin und jeder Einwohner ist auch eine Bürgerin, ein Bürger. Jede Stimme wird gehört. Demokratie braucht Support. Direkte Demokratie muss modern sein. Offenes Regieren dank Digitalisierung. Repräsentation der Unterrepräsentierten. Mediale und öffentliche Infrastruktur. Und Stadt mit auch glücklichen Verlierern. Die Magna Charta ist bewusst norma normativ verfasst worden. Sie will dem weltweiten Trend Rechnung tragen, dass Städte zu Zentren der globalisierten Welt werden und teilweise in Konkurrenz zum Nationalstaat stehen. Ihre Demokratisierung ist heute ebenso wichtig, wie es die Demokratisierung von Staaten war und weiterhin ist. Typisch für die Stadt Bern ist beispielsweise das Politforum Bern. Es versteht sich als Demokratiehaus der Bundesstadt. Das Forum befindet sich im sogenannten Käfigturm. Dieses Gebäude diente bis zum Ende des 19. Jahrhunderts als Gefängnis. Da war eingekerkert. Wer da eingekerkert war, war ein Stummbürger. Ein Mensch, der nichts zu sagen hatte. Heute wird das Politforum für zivile Zwecke genutzt. Es ist ein Raum für den demokratischen Dialog. Aktuelle Fragen der Politik wie der Demokratie in Zeiten von Corona werden da diskutiert. Ausstellungen in Zusammenarbeit mit verschiedensten Partnerinnen und Partnern, wie zum Beispiel der Schweizerischen Demokratiestiftung, werden gezeigt. Und es treffen sich verschiedenste politische Gruppen, um sich auszutauschen. In der Stadt Bern gibt es auch ein Generationenhaus. Die Bürgergemeinde, das sind die alteingesessenen Berner Familien, betreibt es. Moderne Demokratie war nicht immer ihre Stärke, doch setzt auch sie heute auf Partizipation und Pluralismus. So organisiert das Generationentandem regelmäßig Abende zu politischen und gesellschaftlichen Themen. Diskutiert werden sie jeweils von einer Vertretung der alten und der jungen Generation. Menschen über 60 und solche unter 30 werden bewusst zusammengeführt. Schließlich hat die Stadt Bern auch ein Haus der Religionen, in welchem acht Religionsgemeinschaften das Zusammenleben unter einem Dach praktizieren und den Dialog mit der Öffentlichkeit pflegen. Hindus, Muslims und Muslimas, Christen, Alevitinnen und Buddhisten haben hier eigene Religionsräume. Juden und Jüdinnen, Bahá'í und Schicks beteiligen sich außerdem am inhaltlichen Programm des Hauses der Religionen. Ihre Stärken sieht die Stadt Bern als Demokratiestadt nicht nur im Bieten von Räumen für Dialoge und in der Infrastruktur für Demokratie. Dazu gehören explizit auch Demokratie auf Augenhöhe. Verschiedene Teile der Gesellschaft sollen sich gleichberechtigt begegnen können. Mitspracherecht für Junge. Die Stadt Bern bietet auch Partizipationsmöglichkeiten für Jugendliche, die frühzeitig in die politische Gemeinschaft einbezogen werden können. Beteiligung als Prozess. Bürgerinnen sollen nicht nur bei Wahlen und Abstimmungen teilnehmen, sie sollen breit am politischen Leben partizipieren können. Mediale und öffentliche Infrastruktur. Die Stadt Bern hat begriffen, dass sie selbst etwas für die mediale Öffentlichkeit tun muss. So baut sie ihr Angebot an relevanten Informationen für die städtische Gemeinschaft via Internet laufend aus. Es gibt aber auch Einschränkungen. 
Die Stadtbehörden sehen selber drei Relativierungen als Demokratiestadt. Jede Einwohnerin und jede Einwohner ist auch Bürgerinnen und Bürger. Das ist nicht perfekt der Fall. Die direktdemokratischen Instrumente sehen in erster Linie die Stimmberechtigung für äh, die Stimmberechtigte vor. Das gilt für Schweizer und Schweizerinnen. Allerdings, es gibt auch Ausnahmen. Es, es gibt ein Jugendparlament mit einem Vorschlagsrecht und eine Ausländermotion mit äh, Beteiligungsmöglichkeiten für Nichtstimmberechtigte aus anderen Ländern. Aber ein eigentliches Ausländerstimmrecht gibt es nicht. Offenes Regieren dank Digitalisierung ist auch eine leicht eingeschränkte Qualität der Demokratie statt. Open Resources ist zwar das Ziel, auch wenn nicht alle Unterlagen zur Verfügung der Verwaltung laufend zur Verfügung gestellt werden können. Repräsentation der Unterrepräsentierten. Es besteht hierzu keine Quotenregelung in der Schweiz, aber zu diesem Zweck wurden Foren der Inklusion errichtet. Diese möglichst, mö, ermöglichen zumindest teilweise die institutionalisierte Repräsentation, zum Beispiel von Kindern oder von Senioren. Teil 4. Demokratisierung als Daueraufgabe. Das Beispiel der Schweiz. Die ersten Institutionen der aufgeklärten oder modernen Demokratie wurden in der Schweiz 1798 eingeführt. Maßgebend waren damals die Vorstellungen des revolutionären Frankreichs. Was damals ein riesiger Fortschritt war, weist aus heutiger Sicht auch Mängel auf. Denn Demokratie braucht in erster Linie befähigte Bürgerinnen und Bürger, was ein gutes Bildungsniveau voraussetzt. Entsprechend sollten Bildungsprogramme jeweils die Vermittlung politischer Themen umfassen. Zudem bedarf es Anstrengungen zum Erhalt des Friedens, denn Kriege waren und sind nie gute Voraussetzungen für Demokratie und Demokratisierung. Der Versuch der Franzosen aus den Eidgenossen Demokraten zu machen, ist jäh gescheitert. Nach weniger als sechs Jahren war alles zu Ende. Zu schwach waren damals die Voraussetzungen und zu stark der Glaube an die Möglichkeit, Demokratie von oben lenken zu können. Und dennoch waren die Reformen der Franzosen der Anstoß zu einer eigentlichen Erfolgsgeschichte. Ein Vierteljahrhundert nach ihrem Misserfolg kam es in der Schweiz nämlich zu einer wirkungsvollen demokratischen Erneuerung. Nun erhoben sich in den Städten nationalgesinnte Akademiker und Studenten. Derweil wurden auf dem Land Bürger und Bauersleute aktiv. Die Historiker analysieren, dass die wichtigste Kraft der Demokratisierung der Abbau von Privilegien ist, verbunden mit einer egalitären Verteilung von Macht. Das geschieht in der Revolution gewaltsam. Unter Friedensbedingungen erfolgt die Demokratisierung anhand von Reformen. Heute erleben wir eine, eine ähnliche Entwicklung ausgehend von den großen Städten in der Schweiz. Die meisten von ihnen entwickelten sich in den 1990er Jahren nach links. Entscheidend war die Partizipation von Frauen, lange benachteiligte, wenn es um die Macht ging. Heute macht insbesondere die Jugendpartizipation starke Fortschritte. National und kantonal diskutiert man die Einführung des Stimm- und Wahlrechts 16. Demgegenüber herrscht immer noch viel Skepsis bei der Einbindung von Ausländern und Ausländerinnen in politische Entscheidungsprozesse. Einzelne Kantone und Gemeinden haben das Ausländerstimm- und Wahlrecht eingeführt. Ein allgegenwärtiges Argument, vor allem Gebiete, welche von Abwanderung geplagt werden, kennen erhebliche Probleme mit der Rekrutierung von Nachwuchs und da können Ausländer und Ausländerinnen helfen. In vielen Schweizer Städten will man es gar nicht so weit kommen lassen. Vielmehr sucht man nach neuen Formen der Demokratie und die Inklusion von Menschen verschiedenster Lebensentwürfe, Herkunft und Generationen ins politische Geschehen zu realisieren. Genau das ist der Grundgedanke der Liga moderner Demokratiestädte. So, danke. Thank you very much uh, to Claude Longchamp for this introduction and uh, I, 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 he should be now live with us here in the in the Kefik Turm. Can you hear me, Claude? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. So thank you very much. You gave us a, a very uh, broad perspective, a historic perspective. You're also a historian and you have lived in this city for so long time. You told us about the developments of the recent years, uh, but what are the main challenges ahead for a place, a city like Bern when it comes to democracy? Perhaps in, in cities like Bern, democracy is... Yes, microphone, on mute. Yeah. 
this. Okay. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. In uh, cities like Bern, democracy is, is, is a common sense. We don't have to introduce democracy. We have uh, government elected by the people. We have uh, other institutions like a parliament. We have participation. So it's not necessary to have elementary institutions of democracy. But we have to develop a qualitative better democracy. And that's, that's not also easy. I'll give you an example. In political science, it's a common sense that if you merge other communities to, the, to a city, then there's a great potential to have participation. That's the best chance for the future. In fact, in the administration of the cities, there is a lot of sepicism that is possible to have that. To have the right to have common decisions is a problem. To have institutions like e-government Sorry, Bruno, can that's, you unmute yourself? Yeah. Thank you. You're on, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that's, not, that's not really a problem to have e-government, e-participation. That is a, there's a good potential. But to have common decision, that's uh, the biggest problem, probably also for the future. Are there any specific questions in Bern, which, I mean, we will have the Global Forum here next spring, uh, which are discussed and have an impact on this development? Probably the, the most problematic aspect of Swiss, uh, Swiss democracy is to integrate or to have inclusion of foreign people. That's the most, that's the greatest problem because in our tradition, political rights are according to the local people that lives here since a long time. So you have the possibility to, to become a citizen of Bern, but you have to wait several years to, uh, to, to be that. So I think we have in Sorry, once again, um, you, somebody muted you. Um, could you please unmute yourself? Bruno, Bruno, you should un un unmute yourself, please. Here. Uh, okay. Mixing, uh -huh. okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, the integration of the inclusion for the for the people from outside. That's the biggest uh, probably the biggest problem. In Switzerland, we are a little bit skeptical to integrate. Then suddenly, after ten or twenty years, it's not so the problem. But to have inclusion directly, I think that's the most problem. <laughs> and in the cities. There live about 20 to 40 percent from people from outside. That means the democracy is a half democracy. And I think that's a really the, the biggest question. And if there are good ideas from outside in the global forum, I think that will be the best chance to develop uh, the cities of uh, democracy of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bern is a, a small city, but it's a major city in Switzerland. There are plans to merge with other places. Is, how is that handled in a democratic sense? Uh, the, will is, the will is not really great. There is a plan to have to merge 12 communities to the city of Bern. In fact, uh, the, in fact, finally, it's one of this community will reach the, the, the city in the next time. And for the other, it's more the future. And there is a great discussion about the impact of these new communities on the democracy in a, in a city like Bern, because they are all smaller, big, uh, really smaller, not only a, bit, a little bit smaller, they're really smaller. And so it's difficult to have a, a, a 
a fair impact measure for these communities. And I think that's uh, not so easy. There are some skeptical reactions in the, in the administration to integrate them because the idea of the city is we are the censure and the censure has the most impact on the politics. What can we do? Uh, we somehow cannot hear you. Bruno, are you there? You seem to be muted right now. Uh, we, we have a short, short break. They will be back. Yeah, okay, thank you. Bruno, could you please- A great parliament, a parliament actually with 18 person, in the future, perhaps 100 person. So you have also the possibility to integrate people from outside. And finally, uh, actually Bern is one constituency. And in the future, we think that it's possible to have more constituencies. But these are plans from the future. And it's not realized uh, till um, 21 when the forum is here in the city of Bern. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as a last question, I mean, uh, what can you say to people coming to Bern? What is the most interesting thing when it comes to democracy, when you come from outside? I think, I think we have a lot of, 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 of places in the city and a lot of institutions developed since 100 or 150 years. So democracy is, is something of the common life. It's not, not only an institution from the top of power. No, it's, a, it's in the common life. And I think that is one of the most interesting problem, uh, aspects if you come to Bern to see that the democracy functions in the daily life. Thank you very much, Claude. Uh, we try now here exactly the online and on-site uh, combination. It's not always so easy, but this will be the challenge also for the Global Forum next year. Uh, if you're only online, it's easier than if you uh, combine that. But thank you very much, Claude, for sharing this. And we now move from uh, from Bern to Helsinki, which is a, also in a capital city and which has also very interesting uh, practices of democracy and democracy support. I would like to invite Anu Markola to give her presentation. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, one moment, please. I'm here trying to show my presentation. I hope you can see it. We can see it now, yes. Yes, thank you. So, uh, as Bruno said, my name is Anu Markola, and I'm very happy to be here today and I tell you about our democracy and participation work. And uh, I work as a participation specialist for Helsinki City Executive Office. And uh, in my work, I take part in the implementation and development and uh, coordination uh, that is connected to our participation model. And our participation model focuses on participatory democracy, especially. Uh, here, are a few cues, cues uh, from our strategy. And uh, this is something that we are quite proud of and because we think that uh, it has such a strong sense of uh, giving participation and influencing and democracy. Uh, the, the kind of uh, direction for us employees that we actually can make changes and increase participation in Helsinki. And the strategy is called the most functional city in the world. And I think that the functionality uh, is also about uh, being democratic city or democratic, democracy city. And functionality does not only mean the infrastructure or uh, technical sides of the city, it's about uh, the human side. That in Helsinki, we think about our citizens, we think about when we create our services and we make decisions, uh, a lot of uh, citizens and their chances to participate and influence on them. 
And uh, we think that each resident of Helsinki should have the feeling of they are right citizens, that they are uh, actual citizens uh, of Helsinki, and they should have uh, the chance to do meaningful things for our city. And uh, of course, uh, the um, uh, ultimate goal is to make the other, or help the citizens to trust in our city and uh, feel like they have a chance to take part to the city fun uh, functions and uh, to the decision making and service creation. Here are our three principles of participation. And they kind of serve as cornerstones for our participation work, and they have been written in our administrative regulations, though, so we have to obey them in our, uh, all of our city work. Uh, the principles are utilizing uh, know-how and expertise of the citizens and service users, uh, facilitating independent activities and creating equal participation opportunities. The first one is about that, that we know that we as the administrations or the city does not know everything and the citizens have lots of important information about services and uh, what should we do in the city and we need the collaboration with the citizens to make the city a better place and to make the services better. And uh, we are willing to admit this and uh, invite everyone uh, to take part to the uh, service designing processes and decision making processes. Also, we think that the city is a platform and uh, the city is for citizens, not the other way around. So we make the facilities and the citizens can uh, create their lives and live their lives just as they please and make those uh, meaningful uh, things in their lives and uh, work with other people and communities. And we should make it easy, not hard. And often our uh, administration, I think this is a common problem. Administrations are hard and uh, it's difficult for us to speak about uh, services and what we do in uh, the administration side. So how can we make it easier for citizens to understand the city? And for the last one, uh, of course, we want to invite everyone. This city is for everyone. And uh, by participation, we also uh, increase the understanding and respect between different demographic groups. And uh, everyone should have a chance to join in, even if they need a bit of help. And uh, now for the participation and interaction model. And uh, this is kind of the uh, definition of it. So it, it is an operating model for citizens and stakeholders and everyone in the city uh, to participate in and influence the city services and this is make and making. And uh, it's kind of guide for us. Uh, it defines the different ways and channels for citizens and other stakeholders to participate. And uh, this is also something that uh, fulfills our local government act that because our uh, government uh, is kind of uh, strict about we have to uh, have citizens to have um, a chance to participate and influence. So this is kind of the uh, description of how we fulfill that uh, government act. And this model was created as part of our city management system uh, uh, in 2017. And so this is uh, quite important. It is part of our management system uh, now. And when we created this, uh, there was lots of workshops and co-design events and questionnaires. So. Uh, as well as the principles, the three principles, uh, this model, this was created with citizens and NGOs and other stakeholders. So I think this is quite effective and a quite great model for us. Here is a model and a picture about how the participation and uh, interaction model is regulated and how the, it is run by the government, uh, our um, administration. And participation is something that is the mayor is responsible for. And correspondingly, deputy mayors are responsible for the participation in their own divisions. And we have also participation steering group uh, that is uh, formed by 
participation experts and executives uh, in our city. And also we have uh, NGOs, university uh, representatives and our uh, ministries representatives part of this uh, guidance group and uh, the steering group of our admin uh, participation. Also, uh, you can see there are participation plans. Uh, every division in our uh, administration must have a participation plan where they describe uh, the goals and key projects according participation. And because now we have this model, we have more structure to participation also in the division's work. And it used to be a bit more uh, scattered. And there were lots of uh, good things, but there were some areas that there was not that much participation in. So now we have this whole system described and we have more direction for our participation work. This is something that we call participation rocket. It's the basis for our division's participation plans. And you can see that there's more uh, user involvement and more service design and service point of view but also about the knowledge and skills of the citizens and also about the decision making that uh, where citizens can take part. And uh, these are also something that the divisions must uh, do reports, uh, tell their committees uh, about how they have uh, put in uh, implementation these plans. And also there's um, the report uh, in our strategic uh, indicators about participation. Here are 10 areas of participation and interaction model. And uh, the 10 areas are something that connect all our divisions and they are something that every citizen basically can take part in. Uh, everyone can take part in participatory budgeting. Everyone can uh, do volunteer activities and give feedback for the city. Uh, the only one that is not actually for maybe everyone is the influencer bodies and they are the Council of Elderly People, the Council of Disability and Council of Young People. So uh, that uh, part is more about the equality and uh, equality and uh, how we can make those silent voices heard. Uh, because uh, regional participation or participatory budgeting are something a bit more new in our participation, uh, different channels and ways of participate. Uh, I will tell you a bit more about those two. Since 2018, we have had seven rural license and three business license that form the regional participation uh, model. Each major district has had its own rural license and the borough license help the residents by offering support with initiatives and collaboration with the city. So basically they help uh, the citizens find information and connect with the city employees. They also support participation, especially with the silent griefs and those who need a bit more help than others to get their voices heard. And they have had a lot of impact in our participatory budgeting, especially helping people with that and creating the process. And I would like to mention that in 2019, our government gave the Bureau License National Democracy Award. And one of the reasons for the award was that uh, their work with the supporting equal opportunities for participation. And then there are the business licenses who give support to businesses and help them connect with the city officials. And uh, you, as I said, uh, the administration and the city inside working, it can be really difficult to understand. So they help businesses to find new ways to find new business opportunities and uh, understand how they can, for example, get licenses and such. And in 2019 or that year, uh, they had connected more than 15,000 businesses and had businesses participate in the city's projects and build cooperation relationship between entrepreneur organizations and other stakeholders. Now, uh, yes, and OMA study participatory budgeting, we called uh, our participatory budgeting process OMA study, which is kind of our city 
or our Helsinki. Uh, for the first round in 2019, we opened 4.4 million euros uh, from our budget for implementing citizens' ideas. And uh, after the first round, we got uh, 13,000 proposals and almost 50,000 citizens participated in the voting, which is quite good. Uh, the voting turnout was almost 8%. And uh, we were quite proud of that. Uh, these pictures are from these events we made before the voting and before creating the proposals and ideas. Uh, they were called RAXA as construction work site. So we basically built with a city uh, administrators and experts these ideas. So it was really like equal and uh, great events and we have had really good feedback from them. And uh, this year, this October, uh, we are going to start new round of uh, OMA study. And now the budget is 8.8 .8 million euros and the round is going to be two years. So, uh, or the money is divided for two years. So, so we have a bit more chances uh, in inviting what kind of processes and what kind of ideas we can implement. And for the next round, we have had many ch changes also regarding, for instance, accessibility of the process. And that is something uh, for equality and to helping those silent voices to be heard that we have to make sure that the process is easy. So we have done a usability test for our web pages, language versions and cooperation with NGOs in regional use and uh, city service networks, for example. And I would like to point out something on the picture that is on right. On the right corner, there is a man with suit and dark hair. He is our city uh, executive office of our culture and laser division. And uh, I think this is great because he's not presenting anything here. I think he was just interested in the event and he's here uh, working with the citizens and the kids. So this is my last uh, slide and Bruno asked me to comment and reflect on the Magna Carta in Helsinki and how are we doing and I have put green color on those things that I think we are doing quite fine and those are democratization as a permanent task and infrastructure for participation. And as I have told here, uh, our strategy is really uh, participation and democracy friendly. And we have lots of room to work from that. Also those uh, participation uh, principles uh, and that, that they are in our administrative regulations, those all, and of course the model, they, these all give us uh, like room for work for and uh, the reason to make sure that we are doing great and giving every citizens a chance to participate and influence and uh, because we have this structure i think uh, even if we are not as far away as in many ways as we could uh, we are going there we have really great direction now also there is open governance uh, in Helsinki, I think we are one of the world's leading cities in opening up public data and in digitalization. And these are very important for all governance. Also our council and city board meeting agendas and decisions are open and you can from find them online and even you can find them on maps. So you can see if in your neighborhood there's some big decision made, being made or uh, what, what discussions are there concerning your neighborhood. But what I think uh, we should be considerate and uh, try to focus on in the future is uh, representation of the underrepresented and also especially communication. Because uh, often we, when we are in far away with digitalization, we don't remember that, for example, elderly people and maybe those who don't speak Finnish, it's not easy for them to find information and take part. So even though digitalization is uh, great and it gives lots of opportunities, we have to make sure there are lots of channels to take part in and uh, make it easy for everyone, not just those who have computers or electronic devices. 
because uh, functional city should be an advantage for especially those uh, aging people and those who need help. And uh, we, as I said before, we must make things easy for citizens, not difficult or hard. Now, I think my presentation was here. Uh, I'm happy that you uh, listened to this, uh, my presentation. And uh, back to you, Bruno. Thank you very much, Anu, for this really great overview about what Helsinki is doing. It's really fascinating to see on one side this uh, uh, burn as a historic democracy city and Helsinki as a very functionalist uh, democracy city. And it shows how different approaches can be. And it's also very interesting that you show us this traffic light when it comes to the Magna Carta. I think that's a very good approach to these 20 dimensions to see. I mean, we are now all used to these traffic lights when it comes to COVID-19, but the, here in a more positive way when it comes to democracy, the green fields, the, the yellow, you had it black, or the, the red ones where you can really do improvements. I think that's a good way of comparing. Uh, we got a question from Donald to you. Donald? Uh, thank you, Bruno. Um, um, thank you, Anu, for, for the presentation. Your current strategy expires in 2021, according to your, one of your earlier slides. How are you going to go about renewing it? I, I see two methods possibly. One is that you're rolling it over every year and extending it, which is not suggested in your 20, uh, seven, two, 17 to 21 strategy. Or will you sit down and do a complete reconsideration of that, uh, of, of the current strategy, which expires mm. next year, if I've understood you correctly? Yes, you. Uh, yes, you're correct. And that's a good question. Uh, we are going to have municipal election next year, so uh, our council is going to change, uh, and that strategy is going to probably change now. But I think uh, we have been so happy with this strategy that we are going to keep uh, the ideals at least and the uh, goals of it. Of course, I'm not part of the strategy making process. And also we have discussed with my supervisors that uh, there's going to be uh, some changes probably to the participation model, but we are going to do those uh, renewals and those changes with the citizens. And I'm sure our future council members are also uh, very interested in participation and uh, the citizens uh, influencing opportunities. So I wouldn't worry that much about are we going to lose participation in Helsinki because we have such, a, such good grounds here and such good culture for the future that uh, I think we are going to do fine. But I hope so. You never know. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Christoph Brema. Hi. Uh, thank you for uh, this interesting presentation. I have a, a question about the uh, what you call in your scheme the citizen participation with a direct democracy. Do you have any form of, uh, is it just motions or do you have any forms of popular initiatives or local referenda there? Well, uh, as I said, uh, this is more about the participatory democracy. So uh, those ways that citizens can in a bit easier take part. Of course, we have also representative democracy. Uh, we have uh, elections and we have uh, citizen initiatives that the council must process and uh, discuss about. So uh, this is just a few kind of the uh, things that we want to highlight. There are like, I think, hundreds of ways for citizens to participate and influence on the city. But uh, I hope I, I answered your question uh, because, yeah. Thank you very much. You also said that open government is a very key issue in, in the city of Helsinki. And now I want to continue with Jose. Uh, Marine on the go open government program, but also how to support democracy cities. So I would like to give the floor to Jose. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thumbs up. Great. While I am going to be sharing my presentation, I'll ask you a quick question, which is who already knows about the open government partnership? Can I also get a thumbs up? Couple people, yeah, a little bit. Okay, good. Uh, actually, this is at the very end of the presentation. Let me start at the beginning. Good. 
So, um, again, thank you very much for this uh, space to be able to speak to you about the Open Government Partnership and particularly about OGP Local, which is where I um, currently work. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Open Government Partnership, OGP for short, we are an international platform that has been designed to promote open government, to make sure the government advances towards more transparent uh, and participatory and accountable um, government and responsive to the citizens' need at the end. It was founded in 2011 by eight, by eight governments and nine civil society leaders. And currently we are composed of 78 national and 20 local governments um, that participate in OGP soon. And when I say soon, I mean in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be adding 50 new ones and I'm gonna tell you more about that. And as part of the partnership, of course, we have the participation of thousands of civil society organizations um, and jointly you know, at the uh, national and lo local level there's been a development of more than 4,000 commitments around open government. Now the OGP is governed by a steering committee, which is also in the same uh, principles as a partnership. It's made up of 11 governments and 11 civil society leaders. Now, just to give you a really quick, uh, let's say view about how the OGP works in its core essence. So the core essence of OGP is that at the national level, or the sub, uh, local level as well. Um, government sit down with civil society and or with citizens and they have to co-create an action plan. And in this action plan, they have to put in commitments that advance on the principles of transparency, accountability, participation, integrity. So it's very much aligned to some of those um, you know, principles that we just heard about in the in the Magna Carta, including those about, you know, continuing to develop the infrastructure around uh, participation, but also, you know, enabling open, uh, open governance. So that's the key of, of what we're doing. Now, those plans have a period to be implemented, and that implementation afterwards gets evaluated and assessed, and let's say improved until, you know, the government comes back again and does another um, cycle of action plan and implementation. Now, in essence, what it is, it's a platform to be able to enable the reforms necessary to be able to ensure that we can achieve more resilient, more representative, more participatory uh, democratic systems. Now, in and of itself, the Open Government Partnership, the OGP process at the national level is an exercise of participatory um, of citizen participation and participatory democracy to the degree that these policies and what the actions that governments will take to be able to ensure more open and transparent and participatory governments is done in a participatory and open way. Now, that's how OGP works in general. Now I'm going to tell you about OGP Local. Now OGP Local actually started a bit later than OGP. Um, and at the beginning, we only focused on the national uh, governments. And the reason why we're here is because we wanna talk about local governments. Now, the origins of OGP local actually started in 2016 as a subnational pilot program. And in that program, what we did is we started with 15 members to test out how you know the process and, and let's say the platform would work at the local level. And it was actually quite successful to the point that we had a kind of a, a bit of a small expansion in 2018 where we added five new members. And because of the importance that we see and that the partnership saw in relation to you know the closeness and, and if you want to be able to ensure that there is you know more participatory democracy, it has to include and it happens in most cases at the local level. So what the what our steering committee did is approved a strategy in 2019, just last year. And part of that strategy, which I'm also gonna tell you a little bit about, you know, one of the bigger things that we're going to start with an intake of up to, or about 50 plus new members. So we're going to really scale up the work that we're doing 
and allow even more local jurisdictions to be able to join this platform and advance meaningfully through the action plan commitments to be able to, uh, uh, you know, make government uh, more participatory, transparent and accountable. Now, that strategy had three important components. One of them is this uh, first that you can see is the OGP local members. And that is in essence, kind of these 50 new, uh, you know, jurisdictions that we're talking about. We currently have 20 and we're going to be opening, um, actually we're going to be kind of like just bringing in another, you know, 50 plus new members and they're local jurisdictions. They can be at the municipal level, cities, regionals, states, I mean, any sort, any size. Actually, we've taken a lot of care to make sure that we have great diversity in, 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 in the um, new cohort that's gonna come in, including region, size, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of, of, of systems and the like. Now, what we do and what these locals do, because they're the ones that do all the work, is actually develop their own action plan. So they have to go through this co-creation process of being able to determine along with groups of non-governmental stakeholders, which is a little bit of how we like to call, you know, not only civil society, but even broader groups of, of, of citizens to determine, you know, what are the areas and where the commitments that they want to push through to make sure that there's more participation, more accountability uh, and more transparency. Now, that's one component. And as I just said, you know, OGP started as a national um, but since the very beginning, we always saw that there was a degree of integration around national and the local plans. So we're also going to be fostering and promoting a space where at the national level in the action plans, we could also see and channel some commitments that have to do with, you know, uh, uh, promoting and advancing, um, you know, open government at local level. And lastly, and I think this is one of the most interesting parts of it, is that we're going to be really putting some effort in knowledge brokering to develop and curate greater knowledge and expertise on local uh, open government and also connecting experts and practitioners worldwide. Now, this is very much a cross-cutting issue or activity that we want to do, very much you know, linked to what we can see with local members, including that into their plans and also taking the experiences that they have as same, uh, you know, we can do that with uh, national local integration um, area of our work, but also, you know, developing a, a, a bigger and broader community of practice where you don't have to be uh, an OGP local member and you also don't have to necessarily be an OGP member country, you know, to be able to learn and contribute and, and, and benefit from, you know, the practices that we're doing in advancing um, open government at the local level. Now here you can see a quick snapshot of some of our current uh, members and uh, if this um, if this session would have been three weeks later this you know map would be much would have a lot many more dots um, and I'm sure you can see here that there's some um, cities and, and jurisdictions that I'm sure you recognize as part of um, yeah, you know your, your wonderful network of, of, of um, democratic series cities. Now, you may be wondering what kind of work and what kind of commitments um, can you see through these national action plans? I'm sorry, the local action plans. So we can see here just a couple of, of, um, of examples that I would like to highlight. I mean, we have commitments around citizen participation in program monitoring and infrastructure projects. Um, we have around, uh, you know, commitments around being able to visualize and resolve issues around web uh, on through the web about um, uh, you know uh, water provision and, and sanitation and the quality of water we've had you know in in, in madrid uh, uh, you know, platforms such as the city of madrid which was a citizen participation portal that had a component of participatory budgeting as well we have another one in sao paulo which is also very similar and you know it's not only a, a plan that is static, but we've been able to work with one of our colleagues in South Cotabato in the Philippines, you know, to develop a COVID-19 contract tracing system. And what's interesting about that is that it was done uh, including elements of citizen participation, both a multi-stakeholder multi consultative design process, which included civil society, academia, and experts, but also an ongoing oversight council that is also, uh, you know, uh, quite inclusive to make sure that 
the deployment of this you know was very uh, mindful and ensured the rights of uh, all citizens of south cotabato now i'll be wrapping up my presentation and you know what's kind of next for ogp local so as i said new members new commitments that in fact is going to be kind of an engine of you know activity around uh, democratization and, and greater mechanism innovation we really are going to be you know, promoting and fostering and supporting these uh, more than 50 um, new local jurisdictions, plus the already existing jurisdictions who are going to be also developing their plans. Hundreds of commitments are going to be uh, developed. They're going to be assessed, reviewed, learnings are going to be um, taken out um, and, and shared um, uh, with, with, you know, with the broader community uh, uh, of practice. Um, if anybody's wondering, we are just finalizing this intake of new cohort, but we are planning to open up windows to have more members into OGP local as we're just starting our strategy. We're trying to be a little bit uh, measured on our approach, but the idea is that this is going to scale up uh, and we can have as many, uh, you know, uh, willing uh, champions around um, uh, democracy and open government as we can. There's going to be this community of practice, which, as I said, I think is going to be a great, great hotbed of innovation, knowledge sharing, uh, information, and that's going to be open to to anybody. If if you want, you can you feel free to get in contact with me, and and you know we can see how we can get you uh, in this uh, community of practice. And then you know there's going to be the knowledge exchange, and the knowledge exchange is going to be quite focused on some of priority themes that we would like to see. And I also think that they resonate quite interestingly, you know, with what's been discussed around some of the issues um, that the Magna Carta is doing to look at, you know, particularly in the interest of some of the uh, current members that we have is around citizen participation. How do we do it? Not only participatory budgeting, but other innovative ways, digitalization, open contracting, I mean, open data, service delivery, you know, COVID-19 response and recovery. How can we make sure that open government is uh, going through these uh, these elements uh, as well. So the last point I'll make, and one of the things that I messages that I want to send now is that you know this community of practice is not only for local jurisdictions, but it's civil society, is academics, and you know partner organizations that can be part of the knowledge exchange, work with those member members, best practices, and I've already started taking some notes about. Bern and, and Helsinki, and most likely they'll be reaching out, see how we can uh, incorporate those learnings and make sure that, you know, we advance as a broad community to make sure that there's greater um, um, uh, open government and ultimately um, more resilient and more uh, representative uh, democracies. So with that, I have some uh, information here. I'll also drop my email on the, uh, on the chat. And do feel free to uh, contact us. And thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. This is really an impressive toolbox you are uh, providing. Uh, maybe just a, a quick question. Uh, you said you had a, an intake of new members or new cities or uh, jurisdictions to be part of the program. Uh, are there, what are the preconditions to become partner of you? The preconditions are... Um, in essence, you need to be a, um, so your country needs to be part of the OGP, uh, the Open Government Partnership. I know many of the, the, the countries that, that, or the jurisdictions in the countries that, that um, are part of this uh, great network are part of it. So that's kind of like the really most important one. And then afterwards, you just need to send uh, some letters um, demonstrating your interests. You need to kind of demonstrate that you're committed politically that you have the ability to do it and that you have um, you know the capacity to reach out and, and involve uh, you know non-governmental stakeholders that's really all you need um, I think the biggest hurdle is if you're not part of OGP but as I said you know we're really keen on 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 opening up this community of practice um, and get those you know all this knowledge and learning coming in here and we've seen also cases where you know um, non-participating governments say look there's a good method that's a good way to advance towards uh, getting commitments and policies and reforms done and we want to do it and and you know we're always happy to also support things that are not necessarily within 
the the OGP space, but as long as it advances open government. Thank you very much, and thank you for all doing all this great work. I mean, supporting democracy cities, uh, cities who are really interested, where people want to engage. This is a, a very challenging issue, but also an important one. And we want to conclude this panel also with another very fresh initiative, which just has been launched last week, in fact, the European Capital of Democracy Initiative. And for this purpose, we have the project leader of this uh, project, Helfri Karl, directly from Vienna. Helfri. Thank you very much, Bruno, and thank you very much for everyone uh, listening in. Um, it's been very inspiring uh, to hear uh, all these examples, and um, I would like to maybe first uh, tell you uh, who we are, uh, the, one, the, the initiators of the European Capital of Democracy Initiative. I am partner at the Innovation in Politics Institute, and uh, listening to the presentation just before by the Open Government Partnership, uh, there is a lot of similarities in terms of uh, our intention to work on uh, sharing of best practice. Uh, we are an international politically independent organization seated in Vienna. And our mission is to identify and develop and apply innovation in politics uh, cross border and, uh, and across Europe. Uh, Europe we define uh, as uh, Council of Europe's territory of the 47 uh, member states and uh, our uh, aim is or our, our approach is to think non-partisan uh, to work with political organizations, institutions and politicians across national borders. Um, it's uh, interesting to hear uh, from Jose Maria Marin uh, that this works in his uh, line of uh, business as well, because what we, our first flagship project uh, was uh, the Innovation in Politics Awards. And uh, I'm telling you this because it's a little bit, this is a nucleus of what we later on now developed also for the European Capital of Democracy. With the Innovation in Politics Awards, we have um, since uh, four years now, uh, collected 500 projects per year um, and we have uh, asked um, uh, European citizens, a 1000 uh, people's jury that we collected uh, over the internet um, uh, to act as jurors over those 500 projects in eight, uh, this year it's going to be 10 categories on what they believe are the most innovative uh, political projects. Uh, the USB of a political project of the award basically is that this is about, uh, this is about politics. It's not an NGO award. It's about uh, projects where taxpayers money is involved and where at the end um, uh, we can hand over a nice uh, statue, uh, the shape of which you see on the, on the right side of my, of my head here. Uh, to, to a politician uh, uh, on, on, on a stage and who takes responsibility for this. Um, we have been founded five years ago and we have thought about uh, the issue of how to change the discourse on democracy ever since. And two years ago, uh, we came up uh, with the idea uh, of uh, the European capital of democracy. And the background of this was basically that we think that uh, there are lots of panels, uh, not this one, I have to say, but many others where uh, there is this kind of crisis mood about uh, where democracy stands, democracy is in retreat, populists are winning, etc. And uh, at the same time, we saw from the awards that there is extremely good practice happening on the ground. Uh, everywhere and on different level of government, I have to say. No, this is not only true of cities, this can be true. Uh, for example, our awards, they are being organized uh, for all levels of government. So we had European Commission, uh, national ministers, uh, mayors, uh, what have you, as, as, as entries with their projects. And uh, we believe that it's extremely important to create this kind of positive discourse, uh, to talk about the things that work um, as, as you have been uh, doing this afternoon as well. And I think it was extremely, uh, extremely inspiring uh, to hear about uh, the example, for example, of Helsinki, which we have encountered in preparing our initiative as well. It's very impressive, uh, but also all, all the others. Um, 
what we are uh, what we are doing with the European Capital of Democracy is basically uh, that we want to create a selection mechanism whereby we motivate uh, the cities of Europe uh, to buy for this title. Uh, the procedure will work as follows: We will have a um, a jury, an expert jury. Um, we will publish a call by the beginning of next year. We will have an expert jury looking at the bids, which will be developed uh, in the course of next year and uh, 2021. And uh, then we will have in an, uh, 2022. I'm sorry. And in August of 2022. The expert jury will submit a shortlist uh, to um, a European citizens jury. And this European citizens jury, similar to our awards, uh, will be composed of 10,000 European citizens. It will be uh, composed in the most representative way we can, we can ensure to do this. Uh, I'm, I'm framing this cautiously because it's not so easy to, to do so when you have the 47 member states of the Council of Europe, but we will have, uh, we will have scientific advice how to do this uh, in terms of an internet uh, uh, um, uh, collection of, of jurors. And we will, uh, at the end of, uh, of 2022, uh, in, on 15 September of 2022, which is, as you all know, the International Day of Democracy, we will announce uh, the first selected European capital of democracy whose program will start one year later. Um, uh, what, is the, what is the quality of the bids we are looking for? It's uh, obviously um, uh, also similar to what has been uh, developed with the, with the Magna Charter. Uh, it's, we have developed our own uh, 12 dimensions uh, of democracy inspired by many documents uh, similar to this. Uh, we will be asking the, the cities first to have a self-assessment based on a, on a document which has been adopted by the Council of Europe. Uh, and it's a document uh, which is called 12 Dimensions uh, of, of Local uh, uh, Democracy and Good Governance. Um, and then we will ask them, the cities, to prepare a, a curated program, a draft program of what they could do during this one year when they hold a title, what they can do within the remits of their own political organization and the city administration as such. So what we are asking from them is basically to present uh, an innovative uh, and ambitious program of democratization that is realistic, that our experts will have to have to look at, and that somehow answers also to the needs uh, of, of the of to the needs how the, the European jurors uh, will define and uh, then they will win then they will win the title they will have one year so it will be an annual and an annual exercise to do so but this is not the end of the exercise because what we are trying to do um, you have been focusing very much on on the city level and and we believe that there is a lot of best practice to be seen at the city level but we are also um, we also want to use uh, this this city then as somehow uh, um, focusing the debate on uh, the development uh, of democracy in Europe. So we are not only going to have uh, a democracy exercise with the citizens of this city, we are also organizing um, uh, a program with third partners in this city, which will deal with the issues uh, at hand, the challenges at hand for, for democracy in Europe and worldwide. So we will, for example, work uh, on four different tracks we have already identified, which we believe are important for the future of democracy, which is technology and democracy. Uh, there in comprised also the whole issue of, of uh, disinformation, misinformation, social media. Uh, we will have a track dealing with climate crisis and democracy. Uh, we will have a track dealing with education and democracy, and one also with uh, participation and democracy. All those are basically best practice platforms um, that we will organize uh, together with third partners. Um, so um, I think I will I will uh, stop here to give uh, to give the uh, possibility for for questions. Again, I should say um, we have launched this event this uh, this initiative last Friday. 
Unfortunately, uh, we were compelled, since this was taking place in Vienna, um, to do so uh, only online. We had a great, uh, a great lineup of speakers who would have all come to Vienna, but couldn't in the end. Um, the, the launch was uh, taking place under the, under the uh, patronage of the Secretary General of the Council of Europe and also the Vice President for Democracy and Demography uh, of the European Commission. We had uh, the mayors of the four Visegrad capitals uh, who were uh, presenting their case for democracy in those online panels we organized in the end. Uh, we had the mayor of Athens, uh, the mayor of, uh, of Gdansk, um, uh, the, the mayor of Vienna was represented by a city councillor. So uh, you, you see that already this is gaining a lot of traction because it's important, I think, and this is maybe the, the, the political logic of, of the exercise, um, to, uh, to give those who work constructively on, on democracy a, a stage uh, where they can show what they are doing and where they can exchange their experiences. And uh, this already took place last Friday, and we hope uh, that, that our initiative will lead to further, further exchanges like this. Thank you very much, Elfried, for uh, uh, sharing this initiative, which is obviously a, a great initiative fitting very much together with the ideas of what we developed through the Magna Carta. I have one question to you. I mean, the capital, European uh, capital of democracy sounds very similar to European capital of culture, which has been a you can say a success story in the last uh, three decades. What are the, do you have any takeaways from this experience and what do you really want to make differently? Um, the main takeaways uh, from the capital of culture is that it has this effect that Europe is looking at one place uh, for some time uh, with the capital of culture. We believe this is always, unfortunately, only the case at the beginning of the capital of culture. And we learned from this, and this is why we say we need to help um, uh, organize a discourse which actually lasts for one year. So this is our basic learning. And the other, uh, the other main difference, and I think it's a positive difference, is the capital of culture was a great initiative by the European Union, basically. Um, this, our initiative is a private initiative. Uh, we, are, we are working with we are working with partners with international organizations, but it's very much a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. I also put forward this question to uh, Jose: how, how can you, how can a city, how can people who are interested join your initiative? This is now. This is for me. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I I've I've posted, I've posted our, our website, so you can, you can uh, if you enter the website, you can immediately also converse, uh, converse with us. In terms of cities, the, the, the first call will be published uh, beginning of next year, um, and uh, we will make sure, we hope to make sure that everyone in Europe who thinks, uh, who is thinking of applying, can, uh, will, will hear from us uh, in, in, in due course. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Helfried, for sharing. And you have all the links there, also the presentations you will see all on the website of the online global forum. I want to thank all the panelists for really uh, sharing, for uh, starting this conversation in this framework. There are many other frameworks, but obviously at the Global Forum next year, we hope to see you all here in Bern. And I said from the very beginning, I'm here in a prison and I just uh, learned uh, that the prison director is behind me. Yes. Hi, you? <laughs> Hi everybody. <laughs> My name is Thomas Göttin and I, I'm not really responsible for the prisoners here anymore, but for an open house, for a house of democracy, which has been turned into this ancient prison tower. I was following your presentations with a lot of interest, and I was happy that the Swiss example has been uh, presented here in the ancient tower. As you can see, solid walls of the 17th century. And uh, this is now a house of democracy. And we try to be on the pulse of the times, which means like, for instance, yesterday we had a debate on and with and about use and implication participation connected to climate change. Or we are working and discussing since May on the consequences for democracy 
of uh, the corona crisis. And now we are looking forward to see you all, hopefully physically here in Bern next year in the Global Forum. We would be uh, in, in uh, we like to have uh, some of the debates here in this tower. We are preparing um, a documentation on digital, digital democracy. And uh, we try to make a travel in the future of politics. And we are also updating the uh, documentation on the consequences of Corona for uh, democracy and society. And um, I'm looking forward to see uh, other houses of democracy. And last but not least, we are rehearsing with our local rock band, um, a parliament rock band with all different parties to have you um, at one of the venues in the evening here in Bern. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I'm happy that you are not really a prison director, but a democracy house director. And I want to thank everybody in this panel for joining it. Uh, the online global forum continues and I will give back the word to Max. Thank you also from Cologne as well. Um, I just shortly wanted to raise awareness for tonight's event or in the, even, the e evening event at 18.30. Um, about um, the US election in the times of COVID-19. And uh, please make sure to, yeah, yeah if you want to, to tune in and um, I think we will have nice discussions there as well. Thank you.